Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Kind of hoping you'll find this week's episode touching. It's episode 362 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham. I'm going to be joined by a couple of amazing women this week, headlined by... Kieran Sonia Sawar, who plays Harriet on The Nevers, which is premiering this weekend on HBO this Sunday. Can't wait to dive into this show, which is, you know, it's got like this sci-fi, but also uh, so many different angles that you can come at this show from. And I've been just so excited about it from the beginning. Can't wait to dive into this with Kieran and see what she has to say about her character, who's one of the touched, by the way. Also going to talk to Bevan Brew, who plays Angelique on Batwoman. And you saw a couple weeks ago, the is it the finality of that relationship between Ryan and Angelique, or is it not? I'll ask her about that and a bunch more stuff as well. Plus, going to talk about the Kung Fu premiere that happened on the CW this week. A lot of trailers to talk about in nerd news, some good comics as well. But I can't wait anymore. I've been waiting to talk about the show forever, so let's do that. Going to talk to Kieran Sonia Sawar about The Nevers up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Francesca Root Dodson from Gotham, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. You know, I've been so excited for The Nevers on HBO. It's going to premiere on Sunday, April the 11th, and we just happen to have one of the touched with us this week. It's Harriet herself, Kieran Sonia Sawar. Kieran, how are you doing? Really good, thank you. How are you? Doing fantastic. As a matter of fact, yeah. we've seen a lot of movies and TV shows about people with special abilities, witches, mutants, whatever, whatever they might be. What do you think sets The Nevers apart from stuff that we've seen before? I think... With the Nevers, it's a kind of it's a really interesting combination between what it was to live in Victorian society, as well as an amalgamation of that with a kind of huge sci-fi underbelly of the world. And it just makes it special because it's I think it's it's got nuances that people haven't necessarily seen on screen before. And yeah, there's just like a lot of women in in the show which makes for you know just like a different energy I think as the stories kind of transpire and and especially during these times it feels more necessary than ever no doubt about it now being one of the touched has its advantages for some but for some it's also very challenging so how much can you tell us about Harriet's story as we head into the premiere so Harriet is based, she's one of the orphans at the orphanage. It applies to a lot of the people in the orphanage. They're not like true orphans in the sense of like, they don't have parents. I think a lot of them still do have living parents. It's just more that the orphanage is more of a sanctuary for them to be protected against a world that's consistently being challenged with this kind of new touched being that's entered their kind of hemisphere. And Harriet's power is that she can turn things inanimate objects and fruit and veg into <laughs> glass <laughs> not people basically um but she yeah she has the power to turn things into glass with her breath and yeah that's kind of her deal a true artist in every sense yeah. of the word. there you go yeah 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 <laughs> So I was actually, you know, it's funny you bring that up about the orphans because I was thinking about this and I was like, do you, do you think it's kind of a byproduct of the of the time and the place that they're living in that they're referred but that's very true. They are actually not, in fact, orphans for the most part. Yeah, I think that they're orphans in the sense that they've been rejected by society rather than that, you know, their parents have died. I, I mean, having read into Victorian history, I'm assuming the majority of young people in London at that time were probably in the true sense of the word orphans just because of disease and, and everything else that was going on. So yeah, I think for, for them, it's just, it's, it's a protection from it. They're, they're others rather. No doubt about yeah. it. Now fans have seen in the trailers, just what Amalia True is capable of. How do you think that Harriet would describe her? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I actually, <laughs> I had discussions with our creator about this at the very beginning because I actually don't think Harriet is very fond of Amalia. Ooh, um, yeah, I think because Harriet is someone who really loves the rules. She loves law. She loves the rules. She loves abiding by the rules. She wants to be an upstanding citizen. She wants to fight for women's rights. She wants to be able to study 
And I think Harriet thinks Amalia is quite thoughtless and reckless and doesn't really have the best interests of the girls in the orphanage at heart. And I think a lot of the times also there's there's a few instances where like, I don't know how much, I can't even remember whether this is in the first episode, but basically I think she's noticed Amalia's actions and do and say things that she doesn't, Harriet necessarily doesn't approve of. So she's curious about Amalia and her past and what, and knows she's withholding information and sus- she's suspicious of what she's hiding and does beg her for explanations. But I think the way, I think Harriet thinks the way Amalia goes about things is slightly earring on the edge of criminality rather than fighting for truth in a crazy world. Boy, did you word that just right too. <laughs> You guys don't. I mean, you'll you'll under you guys will understand once you start seeing the episodes. But but man, that was some of the best tap dancing I think I've ever seen. You should go <laughs> pro. That was that was really impressive. That was that was great. I, I kind of feel like though, Kieran, that that you'd feel a little, that you'd feel a little bit differently about Penance Adair because I just, I just fell in love with her immediately when I started watching the show. So were you surprised to actually see some of the inventions that she was able to come up with, especially given the time period, even though she has special abilities? Yeah, I loved it. I, I thought it was it was just such a cool, nuanced superpower that was really interesting. When I was doing my research for the part, I found this amazing poster of Victorian society when electricity was first being introduced. And they were all like lying in the wires and on the ground electrocuted. And like, and it was like this whole kind of hoopla and propaganda behind you know electricity being this really really bad thing and this evil that was coming into their lives and so I thought that was like really really interesting how pent that led into penance's abilities and powers and I like it's super cool especially in these times about vaccinations and COVID and all of that kind of stuff it like really it shows how scared people are of things we take for granted now and how when something different does arrive it does make people kind of super wary and cautious and and afraid i mean all of it i think stems from from fear which i think is one of the biggest themes of the show that leads me right into my next question actually because i was going to say more than ever this this show reminds us that people fear what they don't understand right so talk about the multitude of threats that the touched are going to be facing this season oh gosh like so many things like i I mean like i just said like i think the override motion for the show is definitely fear there's an element of fear in every every character in every scene nearly like the fear of not being loved the fear of not being brave enough the fear of not being strong enough the fear of rejection the, you know it's the fear of not being accepted the fear of not class it's just it's it's constant and i think that is something to be expected from from all the characters especially when you when you give them these kind of advanced skill set and then place them in an even further place in the past where it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's going to be a constant battle as to right, I guess, right versus wrong in, uh, you know, in, in that world of black and white. I kind of feel like, too, that, first of all, we're talking to Kieran Sonia Sawar, who plays Harriet on The Nevers, which you can see this Sunday, coming up on HBO and on HBO Max. And, and Kieran, I feel like we are still talking about Victorian London here, even though you talk about all these all these things and... I feel like social rank is something that's still a very big asset in this byproduct of the times. But can we see that become a factor throughout the season as well? I would love to see that come more into the forefront because I think the more, I, you know, and it applies now, the more that people kind of try and pit the, like one against the other in terms of, you know, whether it be race or, or whatever, gender, it, we're actually forgetting the real fight, which is that of class. And I think it's so obvious in in the Nevers because it's just that is the real battle. But we kind of get caught up in all of this other stuff like that makes us different. But the real battle is those who have the power, i.e. like the law, the government, those people that have the power and the people that don't have a say in that. And that really is that's the two sides of it. People with the money and the people without the money. Like that's it. Like when when it boils down to the, the end of it. So we don't just meet Harriet in the first episode. We also get to meet her betrothed as well. So how would you kind of, because we don't get into it right away, but how would you kind of describe their relationship? So that's, it's kind of like a sweet first love 
kind of story. They, you know, they've met, they, they've, they've fallen in love. I'm not sure entirely, I, I'd, it'd be interesting to see where it goes, but I'm not sure entirely, you know, what Harriet's intentions are with, within this relationship. It feels like one of those, I saw on a TV show recently, on a reality show with two people meeting for a first date and the girl was really happy chatting to the guy until he challenged her and she said to him, who do you think is smarter between the two of us? And he said he thinks he's smarter. And that was Uh-oh. it. She was just, she was done. Like, she was like, I'm not interested in this this guy anymore. And I feel like that really reminded me of Harriet. I think she finds him interesting and challenging in terms of he's getting to do all the things she wants to do, like study and go to school and go to college and, and do all of these things and be free. And she's kind of feeding off of that and I think learning and absorbing all she can I don't think she's I don't I personally don't think she's super fluid and 100% in the romance interesting interesting so you guys do have some allies though outside of the touch as well Lavinia Bidwell being one of those and she's a very very important role in, in this in this series but at the same time I've got bad vibes a little bit so how much tease for us a little bit how much can we really trust this woman <laughs> I, I mean I don't think Harriet likes her. Well, I feel like I'm just saying Harriet hates everyone. <laughs> she just wants to be on her own. Yeah, well, basically, there's there's an episode where, you, where the, the touch girls get to meet Lavinia. And it's uncomfortable, to say the least, because I think Lavinia's character is kind of treading this board of between being part of the upper classes and then looking to be helping the orphans. And obviously those kind of intentions are pure always to begin with um I don't think it's come from a place of malice but it becomes strategic at some point along the way and I think that is just she plays a character that reflects a lot of people who have pure intentions but can become overcome when they've been given power and maybe not turn out to be who we thought at the beginning Interesting, interesting. Quickly, Karen, before I let you go, is there a specific episode this season that you're really looking forward for fans to see as far as Harriet's concerned, like this is her big episode? Or is there anyone that you're, another character that you're you're particularly looking for fans to see her get to work with a lot? For me, I think there's, there's this idea for me that the thought that drives Harriet is that the idea that people who try and vehemently push radical change are always in danger of becoming the thing that they fear the most. And for Harriet, especially with her power, she turns things to glass, she makes things clear. Like I think she sits in this kind of gray world that seems to be presented to her as completely black and white. And there's a really interesting part in the later episodes um, between Harriet, it's fleeting, but it's between Harriet and actually Malady. And I think that relationship becomes it's like it's a few seconds but it's so important to me and I feel like that's where two two characters uh, with completely opposing journeys come together for a small moment and it's actually really important in terms of how we should interact with other people in our daily lives can't wait for you guys to see this world come come together because it's really really cool the Nevers premieres Sunday April 11th on HBO, and you'll see her make things become clear, literally and metaphorically, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's Karen Sonia Sawar. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Trust me, this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Harriet on the Nevers. I can't wait for you guys to see more, so make sure you're watching every Sunday on HBO. And again, on HBO Max, make sure you're watching the Nevers. I think you're really really going to enjoy this one. Again, thanks to Kieran Sonia Sawar for joining me this week to talk about The Nevers. Up next, going to talk to another amazing woman about another great show. Going to talk to Bevan Brew about Batwoman and talk Angelique. Up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Yeah, brother. This is Josh Segura, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I know you guys have been watching Batwoman. You know exactly what's going on every Sunday night. It's been a heck of a season, and it, it almost feels like we're at almost like a new chapter in that season right now. Actually, she's had a lot to do with what's been going on so far. She plays Angelique on the show, and it's Bevan Brew. Bevan, how you doing? Hi, James. I am doing great. I'm super excited to be here, down and nerdy. By the way, happy belated birthday, too, for anybody that doesn't know. 
Thank you. It was one of the best birthdays ever. I think in comparison to last year, I was one of the first COVID birthdays. So it was like a house party when that app was really popular. And it was like, you know, five friends doing the weird trivia game on house party. And that was like the huge birthday. Nice. And this year finally felt a bit more normal. And it was amazing. So excellent, you. excellent. Well, I mean, obviously you're you're very well liked. You've got a good group of friends, which is good. And when we first met Angelique, though, wasn't exactly mm-hmm. easy to love her. So were you kind of worried about what that initial fan response would be once people found out what she what her backstory was with Ryan, what she actually did to Ryan? One hundred percent. I mean, even when I got cast in the role, I called the showrunner because I was like, you know, this can go one or two ways. Mm -hmm. Like Angelique can be a sociopath, like just straight up like evil manipulator kind of person. Or she can be what in the end it is just kind of like great intentions, horrible execution. (laughs) kind of overall throughout her life and that is more we're leaning and so I was worried that people would kind of jump to an assumption about her without taking the time to get to know and understand where she was coming from why she did the things she did because I really believe once you understand her logic you know her motives her self like view you can't not love her she's right. really just trying to do the best she can and she has a beautiful heart so I was just like Please, audience, be patient with poor Angelique. Be patient with her. <laughs> really had to be patient, too. Although, at the same time, I mean, whether fans liked her or not, one thing I always realized about her is, like, you know, when it comes to how she feels and who she is, she's actually pretty upfront about it. So was it kind of refreshing to take a, ba- a break from that trope of, you know, just being another love interest character that uses deception to get what she wants? Because you see that a lot, and that's not her at all, really. 100%. I mean, I'm very much like that in my real life. Like, honesty is the best policy. And if it hurts your feelings, put a Band-Aid on it. It'll heal and you'll be stronger for it mm-hmm. kind of motto. And that's what she is. She's like, like my favorite, I think, um, moment for her exposing her logic and pathology was when she's explaining like, yes, I'm dealing snake bite, but I'm sober. Like that, I, her logic there. And she's so upfront about it. And it's like she knows she's learning just how far to push the envelope. And she's learning the balances of life by being able to, take care of herself while also be on the edge of danger with selling the drugs and she's like you need money to get your life together and I'm making that money right now like that's a plus plus a plus plus you know so I just love that she has that logic it's not a very common logic like you said on shows and especially with like kind of the love interest past love interest so yeah super refreshing going back on that as well I mean despite their troubles you can just you can feel that chemistry between Ryan and Angelique when they're together. It's it's very palpable. So is that a byproduct of their long history together, do you think? Or is there a little bit more to it than that? Well, of course, yes. I mean, their history goes back to childhood. I mean, they know each other in and out. They, they feel completely comfortable with each other. The only awkward moment I think that they've probably shared in the last, you know, 12 years or whatever, is that first reunion in episode 204 or it's been two years because Ryan went to jail and it's that moment of like, you haven't taken my calls. Where do we stand? Like that wasn't the only moment of quote unquote, a doubt in their relationship. But other than that, I mean, and it also helps that Javicia is just so wonderful. Working with her is so easy, so wonderful that that chemistry is part the script, but also just part us, which I think also adds that layer of realism to it. Like we really get along. It's funny, I was going to ask you, that was my next question, actually, because when I talked to her before the season, that energy that she just brings, how, how much she just really loves the role, this role and being in the show, how excited she was, did that kind of, in turn, kind of make you excited as well and, and, and make you want to, like, I don't want to say be better, but, like, fight harder to make this, like, the best possible performance between the two of you? Well, so this is my first TV role. So coming into it, I was already <laughs> so crazy, hyped, excited, like mind blown. And then I meet Javicia, who, and I always say this, like her work schedule, you can't even imagine it. How many mm-hmm. hours she is working, how she keeps her energy up. She's doing like, I think 85 to 90% of all of her stunts, you know? So, and then to see her there being such a boss, and then she just makes you feel safe on set, you know, that you can like, play and then she'll she'll joke around she won't make it feel like i'm number one on the call sheet and you must bow to me ha ha not at all she is like one of the it's just one of the people 
she's brilliant, brilliant to work with. And yeah, her level of enthusiasm definitely triple hyped me. And I was already hyped up. So you can only imagine. <laughs> No doubt about that. Now, I think one of, the, one of the scenes I'll always remember involving Angelique, though, was when she knocks Batwoman off the fire escape at her apartment. So were you surprised when you actually saw that in the script? And how does it feel? You know, you kind of got the drop on Batwoman a little bit there. I saw that and I was like, oh, shit. I'm going to get, like, castrated for this. Uh, the audience is going to hate Angelique again for a minute. But the thing is, she didn't know it's that woman, you know? And it's like, she was protecting herself. I've always said, Angie's a very scrappy girl. She's like a spring break fighter. She'll use like a beer bottle and like obviously a barbecue grill top. And she was just looking out for, she, she saw the vulnerability in that woman. That woman seemed weak, a little bit out of it. That woman was kind of like threatening, like, you know, said Angie to the cops. So she was like, what am I gonna, how am I gonna handle this? Oh, barbecue lid get it done so it's, it's like it was a funny exciting oh my gosh what's gonna happen kind of moment but it was fun to execute it i love the stunt stuff like that's definitely my favorite you know you you said that she didn't know that she was batwoman obviously we we know that she still doesn't know but here's the thing i want to ask you how she'd react if she found out ryan's secret instead i'll ask you this what's the first thing that you think angelique would say to ryan if she found out she was batwoman once Angelica passed the ha ha ha, you're kidding phase of the conversation, I honestly think that she would be like, this makes freaking sense. Like you've been saving my ass since I was like 12 years old. So why wouldn't you be that woman? Like, you know, in, in Angelique's eyes, Ryan is just, you know, she, she's her love. She's her best friend. She admires her. She sees her strength and it's only going to grow throughout the season. And I think to her, she'd be like, well, shit, that just makes sense. Like, no, congratulations, girl. No doubt. No doubt. Talking to yeah, Bevan Brew, like, who plays Angelique on Batwoman. Of course, you can watch every Sunday night on the CW. Now, Bevan, I was scared for you in this past week's episode because we got introduced well, to Black Mask and immediately found out the connection that he had with Angelique. So it might have been a short scene, but it was pretty terrifying. So take us inside that meeting and just how scary good Peter Outerbridge is in that role. He is so brilliant. Before we shot that, we went downstairs at the hotel to just run lines together, you know? And he like orders his beer and he's just saying his lines. Like he's not even trying. He's just like, his mouth is just moving. And I'm like, holy shit, this guy's good. Like he just, I don't know. He, and he also, credit to him, he loves Black Mask. Like he's read all the comic books. He's read them all. He, he wanted to do honor to the character and he 100% is. But, you know, where we film those scenes, it's always like these abandoned like sawmills or like, you know, beer breweries. And they're so scary to begin with the location and it's nighttime and it has that smell, a smell of like cold, old mold or something that's just like in the walls of these places. And it's like that plus his costume, plus the con like the context of everything. It's, oh yeah, it's a little scary and he's scary good. No doubt about that. Now, I, spoiler alert for anybody that hasn't seen last week's episode yet. We ultimately get to see Angelique kind of get her redemption. She saves Ryan by taking the fall for what happened with, with the shooting and everything like that. Do you feel like this is the end of their story or do you feel like there's more chapters to be written here? I think there's so many more chapters to be written here. And I feel like I, I have this like this fantasy, you know, like this this comic book kind of love story where you know something happens to Angelique and she comes back and she becomes this like villain but then her and Batwoman are back together like dating but then they're trying to kill each other as like villain and superhero without knowing each other's identities and like that level of like love mess triangle square but I mean even aside from that no they're never going to be done because if they haven't been done by now they're not going to like this is someone it's your ride or die from being in the childhood to growing, we're seeing Angelique is finally starting to make the mature and self-sacrificing choices, thinking more than just herself. So that's showing growth there, Ryan's growing. As long as everyone keeps growing in life in general, there's no reason for a relationship to end. It's funny, what you described is kind of like the Batman-Catwoman relationship. So I think that would be really interesting to kind of bring that dynamic 
to this show because you know you've got Batwoman who would be, play the Batman role, and then Angelique could yeah. be like the Catwoman role, and you could have that little you know villain hero dance, but you know they really kind of are in, uh, are in love with each other. I think you're on to something there, actually. Right? Wouldn't that be so fun? And like they have no idea who each other are and it's like everything's great at home it's great in the bed and then they hit the streets and it's like i'm trying to kill you no you're not da, 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 fighting but i hate you ba, 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 ba. oh i'd be so, be so i'd be so in for that oh do, do you do you have a villain name picked out for yourself like if you got to create like a villain name do, do you have have you thought about it would you could you pick one out oh my god you're putting me on the spot here it's gonna be so tacky and silly i have no idea what my villain name would be well i have to first decide like what's my villain like Thing, but it like, couldn't be know, like it couldn't be like snake bite, right? Because that's too obvious. No, so you couldn't, you no, couldn't do that. No. It wouldn't be snake bite. It have to be a kind of a villain. That I'm trying to get a vendetta on like my trauma. You know what I mean? Because all these villains they come from that trauma. So it would be like having to really pinpoint Angelique's specific trauma and why it manifested into like this villainous persona. I feel like she probably has like abandonment issues. Maybe like the abandoner, or like I don't know, like something like. I don't know, something of like loneliness and abandonment. And, and it would come from that base of like taking what you love away from you psychologically. Ooh, I don't know. I like that. We're going to work. We're going to workshop this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll We're workshop this. Business. We'll come don't up with something really this. good. Yeah, I was actually way better than that. You know, it's funny. I was actually kind of thinking about it on the other side, too, before I let you go. I was thinking, you know, Team Batwoman is it's kind of small right now, but it could grow over time. Do you think she'd actually maybe make a good vigilante, too? I think Angelique, the thing with her is, again, great intentions, poor execution. I'd be like, she, she'd be like the comedic relief. Like the one that's like, oh no, Angie, didn't you go take the package to the right person? Well, you said the other warehouse, right? No, oh shit. Like she'd always kind of just lead, doesn't dot all the I's or cross all the T's, but you know, but she's like, please, okay, I'll go fix it. Like she's so like committed to it. But she'd be like, I'll go take care of it. Oh, I'll be right back, please. <laughs> or something like that. I think that she could add to the bat team in that way. No <laughs> doubt. We'll have to find out what that next chapter is when you watch Batwoman every Sunday night on the CW, and you might think that you've seen the last of Angelique. I don't think you have. And you definitely haven't seen the last of her, though. It's Bevan Brew. Thank you so much for joining me this Thank week. Thank you. Have an awesome week, James. You know, I got to agree with Bevan on this one. I'm not sure that it's really over between Ryan and Angelique, but what's the next chapter going to hold? We don't know, but I can tell you that Batwoman returns this Sunday night on the CW from a one-week break, so make sure you're diving right back in to that very interesting story. Thanks to Bev and Brew once again for joining me this week to talk Batwoman. Up next, we're going to stay with the CW and talk about the premiere of Kung Fu. Plenty of spoilers are ahead, too, next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Taylor Hickson from Deadly Class, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Things got kicked into high gear this week on the CW. A brand new series begins, and that is the Kung Fu reboot series. Although, I'm not sure that it's fair to call it that. And I'm going I'm to tell you more in a spoiler-filled review here of the premiere episode, of course, we follow Nikki Chen, who basically you see, and the way she describes it, she's like she freaked out because it turns out her mom, she thought her mom was sending her on this trip to, to, to China. It turns out she was trying to give her an arranged marriage. She freaks out and she ends up at a, at a Shaolin temple, for lack of a better to, to, way to put it. And she ends up learning Kung Fu and she's got her Shofu, who almost ends up like her second mom. And then tragedy ensues there where her Shofu dies. Not only does she have to avenge that death, but now she's got to go home, the thing that she doesn't want to do. So, I, I, again, you call it a reboot. I don't think it's fair to say that. I actually think it's in name only because, first of all, it's, it's modernized. And I, I just don't think it's a fair comparison to the original series. So we're not going to go there in this review. But I will say that when, when she came home, and this was one of the, the, the tropes I was worried about in this show was, was kind of dispelled. So, you know, the stereotypical Asian family thing where, you know, you, you leave home and you, you, the, 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 the daughter that leaves home is kind of excommunicated from the family sort of thing, right? And then when she opens the door and her, when her dad opens the door and she's there, you're expecting dad to like blow her off, right? Or shun her or whatever. And he open arms, hugs her, tells her, I miss you, miss you. And that was a big moment for me. So I'm like, okay, so we're not going to go there. With this show, obviously, mom had a different reaction and we find out why mom had that different reactions. But that to me wasn't even a stereotypical reaction either because her brother had a similar reaction as well. Her sister was happy to see her, but her brother 
was not always, or Brother Ryan wasn't totally happy to see her at first either. But then they also don't drag that out either. It would have been easy to drag the family dynamic out where everybody's mad at Nikki, right? They don't drag that out. And I think that that was really, really smart. They, she does go to sort of apologize to her ex-boyfriend slash get his help with whoever killed her Shofu. And we find out that he's got another girlfriend. So, I mean, that that's a trope that you kind of follow. You know, the ex-boyfriend moves on sort of thing. But but at the same time, there's a, there's a moment in this episode that I thought was really interesting. And it was just... It was just her standing there by herself, Olivia Liang, who plays Nikki, I, I should mention that. She's standing there by herself after she finds this out about Evan, her ex-boyfriend. And it's almost like she has this moment where she's like, okay, I wanted things to be different when I came home, but at the same time, it's like she wanted them to be the same. And that balance of, of, how to, and of to figure out how she really wants her life to be from this, from this moment on, I thought was an interesting turning point in this series because she you you see her how she doesn't want to go home right because she doesn't think things are going to be any different but then at the same time when she gets home she expects certain things were were just kind of be going to be the same and that wasn't the case so i thought that was a very interesting take in this show maybe i read too much into it and maybe maybe i'm just you know making that a little bit more than it actually is but i i i think that that had something to do with it but we see a lot of stuff that, that could have been easily dragged out and could have easily been a trope we see that dispelled right away in this first episode. We also find out that, you know, her family was in danger too. And it's not just her trying to avenge the death of her Shofu and find out what's going on with this sword that she couldn't pick up, by the way. And she just happens to be getting help from the handsome Henry. I, can we call him that? Can we call him handsome Henry? I think that kind of fits him, right? She, her brother knows him. So obviously he could almost vouch for him like stand up dude, right? This is a guy I could see dating my sister. So you, you, you see the tea leaves here. You see exactly what's going to happen. You see the writing on the wall with this thing. But it's like she's got help from different people for different problems. But I like that there's they're gonna, there's going to be that duality of, okay, I need to know what happened to my show who I have to avenge her death, but I also need to clean up what's in my own backyard. And then we find out that maybe her abilities are a little bit beyond what even she knows. That they are. It's funny though that I, I like how they went the denial route, right? Like she doesn't think that there's anything special about her, and maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's a a deep emotional reason for that, or maybe it's just one of those things where she just just doesn't see it, but everybody else does. So there, there's a lot of different angles to play here. I like. I think the dynamic of the cast was fun. I thought everybody was very likable. That was supposed to be likable. I thought that you, you know there was a, there's some good heat on the villains that you were supposed to not like. I think that that worked out really well. And I don't feel like there's a, I don't feel like there was a ton of progress made towards, you know, solving the mystery in the first episode, which I like too, because even though they quickly dispatched certain things about the family dynamic, they also didn't unveil a whole lot about the larger mystery, which some shows actually, some brand new shows actually make that mistake. I think in their first episode where you kind of get to it, a little bit too quickly. As far as the action goes, I thought that, you know, some of it looked good and some of it not quite as polished, but at the same time, again, pilot episode, you got to expect that this choreography from the, from the actors themselves is going to get better as the show goes on. Of course, some of them were better than others, but I, you kind of expect that that's going to get better as the show goes on anyway, because again, she's, even though she's tra been training for three years, she's not completely polished either. Right? So the, the p fighters that you expected to be polished, I thought looked more polished and she didn't necessarily. So I, I think that that was a really interesting way to go about this as well. So I like the family dynamic. I like the larger mystery. I think that this was a very enjoyable show and one that I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to see, seeing more of. So make sure you're watching Kung Fu on the CW as well every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock on The CW. That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of the Kung Fu premiere. Up next, let's dive into some comics, shall we? It's what we're reading on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey, this is Robert Venditti, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. So if you're missing that big con feel, maybe this is what you should be reading this week. I'm actually talking about the new Green Lantern number one from DC Comics, which is written by Jeffrey Thorne, Dexter Sori, and Marco Santucci on the art here. Alex Sinclair with the colors, Rob Lee on the letters, and Bernard Chang teaming up with Sinclair for the amazing cover art. The reason I say that it's like Comic-Con is because I was hosting this conclave, and there's going to be some spoilers in this review, by the way. It's, gonna, it's hosting, hosting this conclave for the United Planets 
at a time where things are very volatile. Things are there's a lot of edginess going on in the universe right now. Good news is though everyone's in the room and and they're talking and that's you know a good thing. But the bad news is there's a hot-headed teenage lantern named Kelly whose temper is kind of stirring up some trouble a little bit. I say teenager too. She's like 13, so we're talking about young teenager, not exactly in control of their emotions now. When some magical beings actually summon some seemingly unstoppable energy, I mean, all hell just breaks loose on this whole story. Now, inside the chamber, the Guardians kind of get a, a big surprise about their guests and this official gathering. It also leads to a bit of soul-searching, but also a shocking ending that will really have ripple effects in this story going forward and something you don't really see from a Green Lantern story that I, I, I that much I could definitely tell you. This book really has a big premise, but it's also a lot to process at the same time. To me, though, it ultimately lacked a little bit of focus on what it needed to be. Obviously, Kelly's kind of tossed into the story and then ultimately tossed aside. It, it, quite frankly, for my opinion, you feel like She's going to be a bigger part of the story than she actually is. And then when the when when everything hits the fan, she's MIA. Obviously, she's a teenager. You don't want her involved in this big fight, but you expect that. To, I expected it to, to go differently than it actually did. The big hook at the end is great, but this issue felt more like a means to an end and procedural rather than impactful that I really wanted it to be. And I, I do like the folk that the focus was on Jon Stewart Simon Baz is a big focus on this as well, but I just feel like a lot of this was a missed opportunity. The art was very good, though. A lot of clean lines there, good character designs. Love the vibrant colors, which you obviously need in a Green Lantern book. But the lingering question for me was, is if this story can gain focus and pick up the pace a little bit, because that was the other problem that I kind of had for the story. So I'm not giving up on this first issue of Green Lantern, and, and you still might dig it. I'm certainly telling you, I'm not telling you not to read it, but I just feel like, ah, I don't know. I, I've got to be really wowed by this next next issue to want to continue. Now we go for a little bit of magic, and the book is actually called Magic, and it's first issue from Boom Studios is from Jed McKay writing this one, I.G. Guara on the art, Adriana Cosani on the colors, Duke Shire on the letters, Matteo Scalera and Monero Dinicio, Dinicio, excuse me, on the cover. Now, we are in a place called Ravinka, Ravinica, I should say. Um, it's a massive city in this big multiverse, and it's home to the powerful guild masters who are basically your, your, ma your magical masters. And someone actually, and this, again, a little bit of a spoiler, somebody attacks several of these planeswalkers, these, these guild masters, at the same time. They're also, and you figure there's got to be a reason. For this, right? And they even say, they're, hey, why is this happening? And this, this can't be a coincidence. Now, one of the attackers is left alive, and there's a very special magician who has a particular set of skills that to look inside the mind of this attacker. And, you know, whether or not that is helpful or not, I guess is open to interpretation when you read this book, but it does lead to something kind of important. Or does it? Because to me, this book really takes a while to get going. I mean, it, a long while. There's a, there's a lot of setup about the who, what, and where, and then you, you don't get a whole lot about the why because you, obviously you gotta want you want that to remain a mystery. But at the same time, I feel like the first ten pages of this book, ten pages of this book, could have been cut in half or less. Actually, I get that you, if if you really love the the spotlight being on the art. And just the world that they've built around this story, then you will really appreciate these first several pages of Magic Number One because there is a lot of that, and the art is very good. It's stunning. Don't get me wrong, but my mind was was more than a bit out of the story by the time the action came because even though the art was really good, I wasn't going into this for it to be an art book. You know what I mean? I, I'm going into this for it to be, you know, great art and great story. But by the time we actually got to the story, I, I was a little bit out of it. And, and maybe that's just me being impatient, but it also left me, left me feeling like I missed something at the same time, or like I was in the second volume of a story instead of the first volume. 
So I wasn't sure exactly, you know, and, and I knew I wasn't. So I'm like, okay, did I miss something? And and I and, and you go back and you're like, well, I didn't miss anything, but I feel like I'm jumping in to these characters that I should already know, but I don't. Now, the characters do look great, and they, they're certainly interesting, but there wasn't much of a hook here for me. So I'll give this another shot and see what the second issue is like, especially to see how the cliffhanger resolves itself. But at the same time, I just feel like I don't know if this one's going to be able to pick up the pace enough to keep me interested. But you never know what's going to happen in the next issue. It's going to do it for what we're reading. Up next, we've got some trailers to talk about in Nerd News. We'll do that. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Dave Dastmalchen, creator of Count Crowley, Reluctant Midnight Monster Hunter. You are listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It's time for another group of heroes to make themselves known. It's time for Nerd News, and not a whole lot of actual news this week. A lot of opinions, but not a ton of news. So I think I'll share my opinions on a few big trailers the drop this week, Jupiter's Legacy. We're about a month away from Jupiter's Legacy finally coming to Netflix on May the 7th. Finally get an official trailer for Jupiter's Legacy, of course, starring Josh Duhamel and a number of others. It's based on the Mark Millar story with Frank Quitely as well. And basically what you see in this first trailer is the pressure that comes with being a, and it's in the title, Legacy. When your parents are famous superheroes and all of a sudden you're a superhero too and you've got to start carrying the mantle for the family, there's some pressure that comes along with that, obviously. So we get to see that from Brandon Sampson, who is Paragon, and of course Chloe Sampson as well. And how are they going to carry on their their parents' legacies? And that is the crux of what is this trailer? And you, you see dad and he's like, well, you know, we've been doing this for 90 years and now, you know, what have we got to show for it? I thought that was kind of a powerful line in the trailer because it's like, yeah, you've been saving the world for almost a, a century, but now, and yeah, now it's over. So now what? So did they feel like, you know, like they weren't around enough? They didn't prepare their kids for this? Or is it something... More than that. And that's if you haven't read the comics, too, by the way. Obviously, if you've read the comics, you're going to have a little bit of a head start on anybody that didn't. Or are you? Because how much of this story is actually going to be covered from the comics in this adaptation? Because there's obviously going to be some changes here as well. But as far as the as far as the costumes and stuff go, I thought they nailed it. I thought that a lot of the costumes looked really, really good. This is going to be quite an ensemble cast, so be ready for that. Be ready to to learn a lot of heroes and villains names in this. But the one thing you get from this trailer is pressure. The pressure that it ju- that just comes from not just being a hero, being a hero following another hero too, by the way. So I thought that that was a huge, huge message in this trailer. And we'll just we'll have to find out exactly where this goes when the eight episodes de- debut on Netflix on May the 7th. Next up, we head to DC and Warner Brothers Animation for the next big animated movie, and it's going to be The Long Halloween, actually, Batman The Long Halloween. It's going to be in two parts, though. So the first part is going to be coming out beginning on June the 22nd, and this does tell the story of the holiday killer. If you're you're familiar with the Batman Long Halloween graphic novel that was written by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale doing the art on that, you, you know exactly it's the killer that only strikes on holidays, this was one of the more detective-driven stories too. In in as far as Batman stories are concerned, as far as as far as I can say, anyway. And you've got Jensen Ackles, who's going to be returning as Batman for the first time since Batman Under the Red Hood, which is something that's super super exciting. Speaking of Josh Duhamel, he's actually going to play Harvey Dent in this in this movie. So uh, again, again, this is a big Harvey Dent story too. If you remember back to the the graphic novel. So that is a very, very exciting thing to have somebody like Josh Dumel in this. So it's, it, we get back-to-back Josh Dumel stories. I love that David Desmalchin, too, by the way, is playing Calendar Man. And you've got Troy Baker back as the Joker. And you just... that that something is uh, There's something about the way that Troy vo- voices the Joker. There's a rasp to it that really just jumps out at me every time. He plays the Joker. So I was actually really stoked that he was going to be playing the Joker in this particular movie. It's a great cast. It looks like the animation style is going to be very similar to Superman, Man of Tomorrow. You see that because, I mean, Tim Sheridan's writing this thing, teaming up with Chris Palmer, who directed 
Superman Man of Tomorrow, so it stands to reason that it would look somewhat similar, right? So I certainly wasn't surprised when I saw that. It, it looks like it's going to be really, really good. Surprised it's PG-13, though. And I'm not saying that's certainly not a criticism. I'm just, I'm just a little surprised that this one's PG-13. And we'll have to see if that makes a difference or not. I don't think it's going to, but we'll have to see if it does. Here's a name that you've probably heard more than a couple of times, and that is Taylor Sheridan, because the guy is everywhere in TV and movies right now, making some great stuff. And one of the things that actually got lost in the shuffle of that whole, hey, we're going to release movies on HBO Max and in theaters at the same time from Warner Brothers, was the Angelina Jolie movie, Those Who Wish Me Dead, which is going to be coming out on May the 14th. Now, Angelina Jolie actually plays a smoke jumper, and that's basically you're up in a tower looking for forest fires, and then you're like the first responders to a forest fire. Now, something really bad happens with her group. You see that in the trailer, and and she plays a woman named Hannah, so she's still dealing with that loss, and then she comes across this, this boy who clearly is in trouble. Something weird's going on with this kid, but she, but he needs her help. And she he's on the run from what seems like assassins. And I mean, some really bad dudes. And, you know, even not knowing anything about this kid, you know, Hannah decides to help him. And the rest is just really tense. This, this trailer is really, really tense. And, you know, it's funny that Taylor Sheridan always, we always end up in like Montana or something. When you see his projects, but and, but when you're watching this forest burning to the ground, whether it be in the beginning of the trailer or, or in, in the present day of the story, it's just there's something jarring about it. And then you meld that with the fact that you've got this kid on the run. Something happens to his dad. We have no idea why or what's going on. And you're just your heart races when you watch this trailer. I know that that's kind of a cliche. But it really, really does. I mean, there's it's there's this instant, I don't know, sort of bond or something. It's hard to really describe exactly how. And, and you just got to see. Go to downandnerdypodcast.com or our YouTube page if you want to see the trailer for yourself. But, I mean, it, this definitely looks like it's going to be one of those pulse-pounding movies. Going to be coming out on May the 14th in theaters and on HBO Max. Speaking of HBO Max, there's going to be a big celebration if you're a Game of Thrones fan. And can you believe it's been 10 years since that first episode? It just seems hard to believe that it's been 10 years. I mean, yeah, that's right. But it just seems like it hasn't been that long. But the Iron Anniversary, that's what they're going to be calling it. And it's going to be celebrated both on HBO and HBO Max. There's going to be a spotlight page on HBO Max. There's going to be all these different types of videos like best fight scenes is one of them if you want to just focus on like the mother of the dragons arc they'll have certain episodes there for you and as, as a matter of fact they're going to kick off the marathon which is the marathon of all the episodes going to kick off with season one on april the 10th at 10 a.m eastern on hbo2 so if you're a subscriber you can enjoy that plus they're also going to be having a huge charity drive during this whole month-long event, there's going to be a bunch of charities involved. Go to downandnerdypodcast.com to get the full list of charities for that. There's also going to be some one-of-a-kind merchandise. And when I say one-of-a-kind, how about a Fabergé egg? An Imperial Fabergé egg, which is des- which is inspired by Daenerys and you know co-designed by the Emmy Award-winning costume designer Michael Clapton as well. There's more details on that again down on nerdypodcast.com. There's going to be craft beer. Funko's going to have these iron textured limited edition figures that are going to be coming out as well. This is just, if you're a huge Game of Thrones fan, this is a great way to celebrate. And you're going to be able to do this all month long. This isn't just a one day thing. Now, granted, it starts, you know, it really kicks off on April the 10th with this marathon. But at the same time, there's there's already ways you could celebrate right now on HBO Max too. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan, this is one of the things that you you probably already celebrate anyway. But this is just I feel like gonna bring up even more fresh and new debates when it comes to the series. You know, like you watch it again with fresh eyes, and you and you start noticing things from the beginning of the series. I just feel like this is gonna be one of the, one of those reasons to just talk about Game of Thrones again. So bravo to everyone at Warner Brothers for putting this whole thing together. 
Amazon's got some very exciting stuff coming up too, and I'm going to do these in order, not necessarily in order of importance, but in order of when they're going to be coming out. A new young adult series is going to be coming to Amazon called Panic, and it's going to be from the novel of the same name, which is a bestseller from HarperCollins, and it's written by Lauren Oliver, and basically it's a small town in Texas. And every summer, these graduating seniors have this challenge. It's a winner-take-all type of thing. And it's basically to get the heck out of the town that they're in and, you know, get a better life for themselves. Well, this time, the the stakes are raised. There's a huge amount of money involved. And things start to get a little bit more dangerous. So, I mean, you can only imagine it sets the stage for that. So, yeah, you get while we don't have a trailer yet, that definitely gives off some Hunger Games vibes. Right. As far as I'm concerned, maybe you've read. I haven't read the novel. I'll I'll be honest with that. And, you know, maybe you have and you've got an idea of I'm not saying this is the Hunger Games and but maybe a modern day version of it in a weird sense or Hunger Games meets something that I don't know yet because I haven't seen a trailer and I haven't read the novel. So if you're a step ahead of me, tweet me. We'll figure out what's going on there. and, and, And I'd love to hear your thoughts. On that, But yeah, this thing's going to be coming out on May the 28th. It seems like it's going to be a, a very, very interesting series. You've got the author who's going to serve as a pers- executive producer, Joe Roth, and, and company going to be joining there as well. And the cast, not not no huge names in the cast as far as I'm concerned it's anyway, and that's not necessarily a bad thing too either. So you've got a lot of young stars. that but When Amazon did The Wilds, Right, their young adult series there. There wasn't there weren't a lot of huge names in that cast when that thing kicked off either. But guess what? Yeah, that worked out for Amazon. And that was their first young adult live action series, and this one gonna be following it up. I think this could be a really, really interesting one to keep our eye on. And then you've got the Tomorrow War, which was sold off from Paramount to Amazon, and that's gonna be coming out on July the second from Amazon Studios on Prime Video. And yeah, you want to talk about big names. Chris Pratt is the one that's going to be starring in this one. It's going to be directed by Chris McKay. But that doesn't stop there because Yvonne Stravowski, you remember her from Chuck and a bunch of other stuff. She's going to be in this thing. You're going to have J.K. Simmons going to be involved here as well. And basically what this is is you have time travelers that come back to the present from from 2051 and say, hey, there's a huge war going on with this alien species. We're losing. We need help. So they're going back in time to keep people from the pre- from the past to take them to the future to help fight this war and Chris Pratt being one of those. And then his young daughter is a part of that as well. And J.K. Simmons plays the estranged father in this particular role. So you, obviously you feel like you, you know what that dynamic is kind of going to be like because it, it just seems like it's something that you've seen before, but it's. I'm very interested to see how they depict the future. Anytime you do something like this, how do you depict the future and how do you depict the aliens that you're fighting? To me, that is a couple of the key things when you're talking about something like this because it could just be, it could just could reek of tropes, right? Or you could bring something really fresh to the table. So there's a little bit of a risk involved in telling a story like this, but Amazon's got a really good track record. I realize that this is a Paramount project and from Paramount, Skydance, and New Republic Pictures, but at the same time, it feels like if Amazon's going to really attach themselves to something like this, it's not because they're looking for a name like Chris Pratt, because Amazon's got enough names. Okay, they don't need more names. What they look, what they're looking for is the best projects possible. So I feel like the competition in streaming is so high right now that they're not just doing this for a name grab. They're doing this because they think that they've got something really amazing here. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, I want to thank the amazing Kieran Sonia Sawar for joining me to talk about the Nevers, which hopefully you're watching this Sunday, and also Bevan Brew from Batwoman, of course, also returning on Sunday as well. You want more from us? Go to downandnerdypodcast.com. You can also follow along on social media at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and Instagram and at downandnerdy on Facebook as well. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.